Good afternoon. It's a thrill to be participating in this author's lunch, and I'm grateful to Penguin Random House, HarperCollins, and the organizers of FYE for the opportunity. My name is Danelle Padija Peralta, and I'm the author of Undocumented, a Dominican boy's odyssey from a homeless shelter to the Ivy League. That's a mouthful. These days, I'm a lecturer in classics at Columbia, and I'm heading to Princeton in July as a tenure track professor. Undocumented is a coming of age story about a Dominican American boy who grew up poor and without papers in New York, but fell in love with reading, with the humanities, with ancient Greece and Rome. It's about the friends, teachers, and mentors who refused to let me be daunted by the challenges of being undocumented and encouraged me to press forward in the pursuit of my dreams. And it's about the impact and meaningfulness of education, which not only opened doors of opportunity, but amplified and enhanced my sense of self and my understanding of the communities that had reared me and of my obligations to those communities. When I was 11, my mother's dad died in his hometown of Puerto Plata, Dominican Republic. My family was living in central Harlem at the time. We'd known my abuelo had cancer. We'd heard, too, from relatives who'd seen him that he wasn't doing particularly well. But the news of his death, relayed over the phone by one of my aunts, still came as a shock. The night the phone rang, my mom cried and cried. And she spoke with her mother and each of her five sisters. I didn't know what to do except hover over her with my very serious little man expression. I had only the vaguest memories of my abuelo Memo, uh, whom I'd last seen when I was four. But when my mom took a break from talking on the phone and dried her eyes, I plucked up the courage to ask her why we weren't heading back to Puerto Plata for the funeral. Everyone was going to be there, my grandmother, my aunts, the cousins whose name I knew, the many cousins whose names I didn't know. Why weren't we getting ready? I mean, I, I knew we were broke. We lived in a rundown apartment building where the tap water ran brown and the lights would go off every few months. But mom was a magician when it came to stretching money. And perhaps one of our relatives might even help. And it was at that point that mom started crying all over again. Through her tears, she explained to me that we couldn't go back to the Dominican Republic because we didn't have papeles. We'd overstayed our visas. We didn't even have valid passports. Were we to leave the United States, she explained, we wouldn't be able to come back. At the sight of her tears, I felt so ashamed and angry at myself for having even asked the question. But in the days and weeks that followed, my anger and shame sharpened into determination. I didn't fully get what papeles were or how I'd go about getting them, but I was resolved to obtain them. And every time mom dreamed aloud of her triumphant return to the Dominican Republic, American educated younger bo boys in tow, I told myself that I was the one who would make that dream a reality. I would get us the papeles we needed. Well, that was quite some weight to carry as a kid. So how did that weight materialize in the first place? When I traveled with my parents from Santo Domingo to New York City in 1989, I had been told we were making the trip because my mom, who was pregnant with my younger brother, was sick and needed medical care for gestational diabetes. While she received prenatal care in New York, I was enrolled in kindergarten, and soon my teachers began writing home about how much I was enjoying learning English, a process that also embarrassed my parents since I would begin to imitate strangers on the sidewalk as much as possible. After my brother was born and my mother recovered from a medical setback, my parents weighed the pros and cons of returning to Santo Domingo. The pros, they had middle class jobs, we had family everywhere in the Dominican Republic, a language they knew was spoken. The cons were the crime rate, so-so schools, limited opportunities for upward mobility, and a very turbulent economic and political scene. After nights and mornings spent arguing, my parents decided to make a go of it in New York City. There was only one problem, which is that we'd come to the United States on temporary tourist visas, and these had expired. But not ones to be easily deterred. My parents reached out to friends and were told that there was a man who could sort out their paperwork. They gave him their savings. He disappeared with their savings. And we never heard back from the immigration service. My parents had been hustled. And this was their welcome to America. But without papeles, my mom and dad had a very difficult time landing steady jobs. 
While nursing my little brother, mom wrote pieces for a Dominican American newspaper. While my dad drove cabs, worked a fruit stand during the summers, took a factory job during the winters. But even added up, these odd jobs didn't leave us with enough money to cover the rent regularly. We moved around constantly, from an apartment we briefly split with my aunt and uncle in Queens, to our own apartment in Manhattan, to another in the Bronx, to a house attic in Queens, to two different apartments in Queens. But after four years of moving around and moving me from school to school, my dad announced that he'd had enough, and he begged my mom to return to the Dominican Republic. Mom refused. She told him over and over again that there was no way she was going to pull me out of school in New York and deny me or my brother the opportunity for an American education. And so, one day, my dad packed up his belongings and bounced. Mom didn't flinch. She vowed to persevere. We went on public assistance and we tried to make ends meet on the food stamps and cash that were paid out to my little brother. But six months after dad left us, we were evicted from our queen's apartment. A friend of a friend opened his basement to us, and we lived there until the pipes burst and the basement was flooded, at which point we entered the New York City shelter system. At the first shelter, mom worried constantly about the conditions of the communal men's bathroom and argued with shelter staff to be allowed inside the bathroom while my brother and I showered and brushed our teeth. But shelter staff refused to grant her permission to step into the bathroom with us, so she ordered me to scream as loudly as I could if anyone came near me or my little brother and ordered us to keep our sneakers on so that our feet wouldn't touch the pools of urine or streaks of feces on the bathroom floor. Throughout our time in the shelter system, mom drilled into my brother and me her belief that it would all work out no matter how many nights we went to bed cold or hungry. We just had to remain focused on our education and mom was determined to ensure that I spent as much time in libraries as possible. And it was in the shelter's library one night that I discovered a book that would change my life. The book was titled How People Lived in Ancient Greece and Rome. And it was a slim textbook that spoke of the legacy the ancient world had imparted to our modern world. With the book in my nine-year-old hands, I felt for the first time the empowerment that came with imagining myself in a new space a transport into alterity that being immersed in a book can provide. In the magic of literature and history, I left the shelter behind for classical Athens and imperial Rome. While we were living in the shelter system, I was also fortunate to come under the wings of an afternoon arts instructor, a man named Jeff who had spotted me reading and taken a liking to me. Learning about ancient Greece and Rome had fired me up with a passion for educational opportunities, but it was Jeff who made it possible for me to obtain the education that had been denied to me while my family hopped from apartment to apartment and shelter to shelter. A private school product himself, he guided my mother and me on our odyssey through private school admissions in New York City and helped me secure admission to an all-boys school and adjust to my new settings at that school. In Undocumented, I revisit the challenge of coming to grips with the vast differentials in wealth and access that separated me from my classmates, and of making sense of the assumptions that some of my new classmates made about me, assumptions that I would much later recognize as forms of racialized aggression. My saving grace came in the form of several very close friends and my teachers, whose expectations pushed and molded me. By the time I was a high school junior, I was told and affirmed in my desire to apply to an Ivy League school, and I was encouraged to aim for Princeton. But here, my lack of papeles, the secret of my middle and high school years, finally reared its ugly head. If I didn't have papeles, I wondered, would colleges even admit me? And how could I pay if I didn't qualify for any kind of financial aid? We didn't have a dime to spare. Mom was cleaning apartments to supplement our public assistance benefits, but we were still chronically broke. So what was I going to do? Well, you'll have to read the memoir to find out. Ha ha, not gonna spoil that. At no point in my journey from high school to Princeton to Oxford and finally to Stanford for a PhD was success in the desire to pursue my education and adjust my immigration status guaranteed. And at many points I received advice to the effect of, well, that's not gonna happen. The overhaul of the Immigration Service after 9-11, coupled with the ongoing inability of Congress to pass comprehensive immigration reform that might provide a path to legalization, left me in a limbo state of uncertainty. But in the many years of dealing with the Immigration Service, 
I kept growing frustrated and tired from living in the echo chamber of my anxieties, only to then hear my mother's voice in my head and often over the phone. Stay focused, concentrate on your education. And in the end, it was my education that saved me. It was that education, not only at the institutions I've mentioned, but at the hands of the mentors and teachers whose stories are woven into mine, that inspired me to take ownership of the voice whose shifting inflections and registers animate undocumented. Some years ago, a college friend of mine told me that she'd never understood why, in conversational speech, I move so abruptly and with such apparent glee from high to low, something I'm not doing for your benefit today, until she realized that this play in languages is so central to the identity I've created for myself as someone who loved to learn languages. As a document of how I grew into my knowledge of languages, my memoir modulates from the simple syntax and bilingual diction of my childhood to the interlocking codes of my adolescence, from private schoolies to slang. And then as I approach adulthood, the linguistic cadences shift again to accommodate the books I was reading, the Latin and Greek I was absorbing, the transformative classroom experiences I was having. From childhood to boyhood to youth, I try to capture for my readers not only my responses to my and my family's experiences, but the language through which I processed and understood those experiences. Language and voice are charged matters for the community I proudly claim allegiance to. The 11 million plus undocumented immigrants who are so regularly deprived of a voice, sidelined and marginalized by an immigration policy that subjects many of them to the perpetual threat of deportation and by a toxic political discourse that refuses to recognize them as accomplished and indispensable contributors in so many sectors of American life. That my editor and I chose undocumented as the title for the book is in itself intended as a statement. The continuing and pejorative use of the term illegal needs to come to a stop. But in emphasize, ah, yes, applause, I like it, yes. And it's on cue since I have to finish now, too. But in emphasizing lack of documentation as a defining aspect of my life story, the memoir underscores one of the inherent absurdities of the American immigration system, the fact that my family's life was threatened and obstructed, and the lives of so many families continue to be threatened and obstructed by not having a few pieces of paper. Contrary to the myth perpetuated in many circles, getting papeles doesn't involve waiting one's turn in line. There is no line. My odyssey is about the challenge of finding and defining a home for yourself when the country you call home refuses to acknowledge you as a fully enfranchised member of its civic community. Thank you.